Hey everyone, welcome back to getting in a college coach conversation. We are jumping into some of your listener questions. As I mentioned in our last segment, you can always send us a question. You can do that on our Facebook page. You can do that by sending us an email, gettingin.voiceamerica at gmail.com. Uh, you can shout at us on Twitter. You can leave a comment on an Instagram page. What else is there, Shannon? I, help me out here. Oh, geez. Um, YouTube, LinkedIn, our website. There's a, there's pigeon. a direct, yes. <laughs> We'll That's our preferred mail. method. Yes. You can figure out <laughs> Shannon's you... address and mail her a postcard. She'll answer that. Bring it. Absolutely. We're not going to share it here on the show. You got to, you got to figure that out. Please don't investigate. <laughs> <All right>. uh, <laughs> Let's encourage the stalkers. <laughs> uh, stalkers already know that this is Shannon Vasconcelos, one of our college finance experts and a regular here on the podcast. Um, Shannon, let's just jump right in. I'm going to yes. ha have you do, let's do an admissions question first. Cause I feel like talking. Okay. And the first question comes in from Shannon. What? <laughs> This That's may okay. be an asking, this actually is, I'll confess, an asking for a friend question. This, Shannon, is me, not actually for myself, but this question came up in my local town mom's Facebook group. Okay. It was posed cool. by the parent of a high school senior. Mm -hmm. It got the moms in a tizzy. And okay. I want you to tell us if they should be in a tizzy. They Usually received no. that. The parents of high school seniors received an email from the principal, and as part of that email, it noted that the GPA that was being reported on the transcripts of seniors that were being sent to colleges uh, would include grades. The GPA would include their grades from semester one only courses, so courses they completed, but not semester one grade grades from their full year courses. So, you know, they're halfway through those courses at this point. Those grades they've received so far would not be included in the GPA calculated mm -hmm. on the transcript. Would this put those seniors at my local high school at a disadvantage in the admissions process? No. Thought so. That's yeah. what I told them, Ian, but I wanted to check with you. <laughs> That's great. Um, the first thing just overall is any policy at your child's high school is not going to negatively impact your child because it's not something that's in your child's control. So the important thing from a college admissions perspective is we want to understand the context for every applicant and the context is set by the school where they attend. If a school decides that our policy all of a sudden is instead of A's, B's and C's, we're going to give Q's, L's and R's, that's the choice of the school. And the admission office is going to try and figure out what those grades mean and what they represent. The other thing here is that GPA is an average. Remember, it is not a specific grade. It is an overall snapshot of a student's performance. And college admission officers are focused on the grades themselves. So if the mid-year report includes partial grades despite omitting those grades from the GPA, that's fine. If counselors are able to reach out to admission officers and say, here's a progress report for this student, note that these grades are not final, that's fine. So, you know, college admission officers will use whatever info is available to them to make that decision. But the GPA is just not a super important number by and large. And so we can just focus on the grades themselves. And again, understand that the context is set by the school. Where Perfect. And is it true that most colleges, whatever GPA the high school provides, will likely recalculate it using their own method on the college's if, end anyway? If the high school GPA is the same as how the college reads that GPA, it's usually coincidence. The college doesn't care what the high school's calculation method yeah. is. They use their own system. Um, and, you know, I always tell people when I read applications at read. I didn't know what a student's GPA was, nor did I care because I yep. had all of the factors that determine yes. that GPA much better, clearer snapshot. Perfect. Um, we've got this guy, Rob, who sent us three questions. They don't appear to be three part question. They appear to be right. three separate questions. <laughs> we love getting questions from everybody. Uh, so let's start with Rob's first question. Yes. Um, if you live out of state, but are awarded in-state institution at a particular university. This would be public, I would assume. Yep. For aid purposes, does your cost of attendance total remain at the out-of-state level because you're not a state student or the in-state level because you are awarded in-state tuition? So I think that to come down to it, it um, to answer Rob's question, it's not, there's two ways, let me step back. There's two ways a college could, could view 
the awarding of in-state tuition. And first of all, the cost of attendance is a number, it's a budget a college sets that is essentially the most a student could receive in financial aid or borrow in student loans. It is an estimate of what it would cost the average student to attend this university for a year. Okay. So in this situation where it's an out-of-state student awarded in-state tuition, presumably because this is an out-of-state student that the college really wants to enroll, is trying to recruit them, offers them this tuition discount. A uh, couple ways a college could do this. They could either keep the tuition, the cost of attendance at the out-of-state level and award this student, let's just put some numbers that, uh, on it to make it a little easier to understand. Let's say the out-of-state tuition is $20,000 more than the in-state tuition. Maybe the full cost of attendance budget for an out-of-state student is $50,000. They're awarding the student in-state tuition, um, so essentially giving them a $20,000 scholarship, meaning their remaining cost of attendance is $30,000. Now $30,000 is the most they could receive in additional financial aid scholarships borrow in student loans. That's one way the school could approach it. They could also simply give this student an in-state tuition budget. So now their cost of attendance is $30,000 and they can receive other financial aid and scholarships and loans totaling $30,000. Either way, it's sort of a technical process behind the scenes of what the actual cost of attendance looks like. But in either situation, this student can receive no extra scholarship funding. They can't borrow any more in student loans. So however technically the school does it, um, a student cannot receive in total financial aid scholarship student loans any more um, than e their cost of attendance or it's really the cost of attendance less any other financial aid and scholarships they're getting. So either way, in this scenario, it's $30,000. They're not getting any more money than that. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. So they don't say like, you're actually out of state. And so maybe you want some more money. They would say, this is what it costs you to attend this school. This is how much we're willing to give you. Exactly. Gotcha. Yep. Uh, next question for you, Ian, comes in from Rebecca. She emailed us. I'm a private school counselor and regular listener to your podcast. Thanks all right. for all the work you do. We love it when school counselors uh, write into us. This is That's phenomenal. Uh, Rebecca asks, are you seeing concurrent credit programs emerge as AP dual enrollment replacements? How do colleges view concurrent credit in the application process? And do they hold up the same way that AP courses or dual enrollment courses do as far as demonstrating rigor to colleges? How likely are concurrent credits to transfer to various types of institutions? So concurrent credit, I think of as being very similar to dual enrollment types of classes. And I, I wonder if this is a distinction without a difference. It might just have to do with yeah. what the institutions that are offering these credits actually call, call the them. programs, right? So a dual enrollment program um, could be a program where you are taking a class at your high school and it is sponsored by a local college. Maybe it's a community college, maybe it's a four-year school. And by taking that class, you are earning credit both at the institution that's sponsoring it and at your high school because you need high school courses in order to graduate. For a concurrent enrollment class, uh, typically you can take a class at a community college or university and that credit transfers back to your high school. So you're taking the class on the campus, mm -hmm. but you are actually getting credit in both places. It's possible I even have those distinctions switched and dual enrollment <laughs> happens on the college <laughs> campus and concurrent enrollment happens mm -hmm. on the high school campus. The function of this is that basically you've got a an ostensibly college level course that's counted twice. It counts as a high school class. It also counts as a, as a college class. That's where the issue comes up, is that many colleges and universities don't count those credits twice. They would say, look, if you're going to count this as a high school class, which we'd like you to do because it satisfies the graduation requirement, then you cannot also claim it as a college mm -hmm. class. It needs to be in one bucket or the other. And we're happy to say, yes, this was a rigorous class. You took it at a college yeah. campus or it was sponsored by a college. It's at the college level. But what we can't do is give you credit at our institution for taking this class. 
And that's because a lot of schools, I have, have rules about how they recognize that credit. And they also want you to take classes on their campus. That's, that's part of what it means for them to award the degree at the end of your process. Right. And so when colleges promise credit for high school students, whether through a dual enrollment or a concurrent enrollment process, typically that promise is much more overstated than is the reality. It usually applies only to a small handful of schools. Um, you know, if you look at Running Start, for example, in the state of Washington, that is a dual enrollment kind of program where students are taking community college classes, but those credits only transfer to seven public institutions in the state of Washington. And so if you want to take those credits out to Oregon or to California or to a private school, even in Washington, you can't take them with you. Right. So for students who are wanting to stay local, who like the options that are available to them in state, who recognize that these credits transfer, I think dual enrollment to concurrent enrollment programs can be really good. For students who are looking for more flexibility or who are looking at more selective institutions, AP coursework tends to be better from a standpoint of an admission officer, because it is standardized. We know what the AP level of work is, which is much different from the wide variety that you're going to see across community colleges, from high school teachers, and from community college professors. So that AP level hits a certain benchmark that I think is really helpful yes. for admission officers when they're evaluating students. Um, so hopefully that answers the question, uh, you know, in terms of those, those distinctions, um, yeah. I would tend to say for top students, look at AP or IB. Um, right. but, but for students who are looking at those local and state options, dual enrollment can be really nice too. That's helpful for me. I hadn't thought of it that way that the AP course is not better necessarily, but it's standardized and that's what the colleges can count on. That's right. Um, I have a student this year who's actually, he exhausted his um, high school curriculum. He took all of the APs that were available to him there and then went to the community college after that to be able to mm -hmm. round out his curriculum, which I thought was really cool. And it was a yeah. way for him to get some, some good experience that he wouldn't have gotten at his home high school. So that's a really great option for students. But I typically would say try and exhaust that high school curriculum before you mm -hmm. start to go outside of it to look for other opportunities. Got it. Uh, let's go back to Rob. Um, yes. Rob from Texas is wondering, uh, is it true that payments to student loans are only reported to credit bureaus after a student graduates and that loans paid off while in college are not reported to credit bureaus? This is a good question. I will be perfectly honest with Rob that I wasn't sure of the answer to this question. So I do what I often do when I don't know the answer to a question, I took it to my colleagues, both my colleagues who actually have children in college who are borrowing student loans, as well as my colleagues who, before joining us here at Bright Horizons College Coach, worked in the lending industry at student loan lenders, student loan servicers, and asked them what they did. Uh, and the universal answer I got from everyone I spoke with was that this is not correct that the student loans are reported fairly immediately to the credit bureaus that my colleagues with children in college could see those loans on their credit report and my colleagues that had worked in the lending industry also reported that their uh, former employers did in fact report um, to credit bureaus immediately. So not a, don't know exactly the motivation behind Rob's question here. I'm guessing maybe they are looking for a way to help their college student build credit. Maybe they don't need to borrow student loans and they're wondering if they should take them anyway to start building a credit history. And that would be one strategy um, that would work to, to start building a credit history. There are other things you could do. Now, depending on the kind of student loans you're offered. If you have some financial need, you'll be offered subsidized loans, which don't any recruit any interest until after graduation, in which case this is almost a no cost prospect. Sure, take the loans. It doesn't cost you anything for four, your four years of college. Uh, however, if you don't qualify for subsidized loans and it's unsubsidized loans that you're qualifying for, those will begin accruing interest immediately. So there is would be a substantial cost to the strategy to help build credit. Um, there are other things you can do taking out a, uh, the student could take out a secured credit card or be made an authorized user on the parent's credit card, can start building a credit history. That way, um, there's a new program that's run out of Experian, the credit bureau called Credit Boost, where um, 
a, it's usually a young person who could benefit from this. If you pay your rent on time and utilities on time, things that aren't typically reported to credit bureaus, you can actually get them sort of counted into your credit history and towards your credit score. So those would just be some other strategies. Um, but the, the student loan strategy will also work. Um, there just may be a cost depending on the, the loans that you're qualifying for. Cool. That sounds great. Yeah. Let's do one more. I think uh, this one from Monica is potentially fun. To talk Monica about. asks, how do you think the college admissions process will change or be impacted by chat GPT in relation to college essays? This new open free AI now just passed an Ivy League exam and the medical bar exam and can write a pretty good essay in seconds. Yeah. So Shannon, we were all in New York together on the admission side. We got to gather yes. um, at the end of uh, last month. And that's when Sally and Beth and I were able to hang out and do the podcast together. And this was a big topic of conversation yeah. for us uh, because I think, I think this news had just come out at that point in time. I would sort of take maybe argue Monica's question where she says it can write a pretty good essay in seconds. So it depends on what you define as pretty good. Pretty good. Um, yeah. It's <laughs> It's not really a good essay. I think it it has the rhythm and feel of kind of a standard middling college essay. But the thing mm -hmm. to keep in mind about chat GPT is that is it really just a souped up search engine at this point. It's really not artificial intelligence in many ways. So what it does is it, it reaches out and it mines across all of these data and it pulls in information from across all those data and says, here's something that kind of looks like what I think you're asking me for, which is mm -hmm. why it resembles a good college essay because they're looking across many, many examples and saying, these are the pieces that I think are mm. required in order to make this work. What it lacks, of course, is the humanity, the personality, the personalization yeah. that comes from that. And so I, I, I'm not especially worried about the impact that it's going to have on um, students writing essays. I do think that there will be some impact in terms of how colleges um, will communicate their expectations to students. Uh, to me, submitting work that was written by an AI program is a form of cheating. And I think colleges might just have to be a little yeah. bit more explicit about the fact that that it is, um, you know, and, and students need to be careful about the way that they use these tools in order to provide content that supports their efforts. Um, there's a great podcast that I want to say Ezra Klein hosted with a proponent of AI who was critiquing the quality of chat GPT and, and whether mm -hmm. it's actually going to be able to do the kinds of things that we fear it will do um, as a right. writing space and, and calls into question that that is something that will happen. Um, and then I talked to our friends over at Arbor Bridge um, just yesterday and, you know, Megan over there said that uh, she thinks it's going to be a paywall soon that right now it's free and it's collecting all of your data as you're asking at this <laughs> info, but soon it's going to put up a, a paywall and it's going to ask people to have to pay to use it. So my view, which is actually in the minority here at College Coach, is that I don't think we'll be talking about chat GPT in a year. Um, and I'm not super concerned about it, but I do think that ongoing questions about writing and about how we use technology to communicate yes. um, are very, very important outside of the scope of the college process. And the reason I love the essay, Shannon, is not because it's a torturous process for the students I work with, though they perceive me to love it for that reason, <laughs> uh, it's because being able to communicate your thoughts and being able to articulate who you are and having to go through that brainstorm is a really helpful exercise that is reflective and personalized and to me, very, very important. So I, I don't want to see students trying to sidestep that with technology. Right. I want to see them embracing that opportunity and looking for a way to share who they are with colleges. Um, so this is my podcast. This is my soapbox, my podcast. <laughs> I get to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> on uh, are you worried okay. about chat GPT? Is it something that like, as you read this stuff that, that worries or concerns you, or just like, you just don't know what to think? What do you think? I, I'm not particularly concerned like you. I, I, I can't get over the fact that I just simply don't believe that a robot computer can convey the kinds of things that we as human beings can. Um, I remember the, I forget which newspaper it was in one of the major outlets. It's, you know, it's the headline was ChatGPT can write your term paper 
dot, 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 but you will fail. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I, it's, it's not something that, um, that I lose sleep over. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Megan's point about the paywall is an excellent one. The robots always win. They're going to get paid no matter what. (laughs) That's right. They're going to defeat us, Uh, but not this year. Uh, Shannon, thanks for coming on the show. We've got tons of questions to get through the next time you show up. Um, So glad to have you anytime. Thanks, Ian. All right. When we come back, we're going to talk about taxes, everybody's favorite subject. So don't go away. (laughs) 